Good evening. Thank you for coming out tonight. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here tonight to deliver this lecture called Building the Mathematical Brain. Now, I want to start by just uh, having us consider how much we use numbers in our everyday lives. So, say it's a busy evening, you're coming home, you're going to the grocery store, and you want to show that your family is healthy, so you're going to buy some apples. But because you're under real time pressure, you're just going to grab a bunch of apples. You're not necessarily going to count them out, considering how many days of the week there are, how many members of your family. You're using a sense of numerosity in that case. Compare that to a lazy Saturday morning. You go to your local farmer's market. And now you have a lot of time, and you want to make sure that you're not buying too many or too few apples, so you count them out exactly. So in that case, you're using exact enumeration another form of numerical cognition. In both cases, you're probably not thinking about the fact that you're using numbers. But without a sense of number, you wouldn't be able to do that simple everyday activity. So our numerical knowledge, our numerical abilities really inform our everyday thinking and critically also our decision making. Every morning when we wake up, we use numbers to inform our behavior. And I realized that I actually need a different example because this says 8.25 p.m., which is not the time that I normally wake up, just in case you were wondering. There is also good reasons to think that maybe animals share with us a basic sense of quantity. Imagine you're a lion and your stomach is grumbling, it's lunchtime, and you're surveying the scene of what looks to you very tasty animals you might use quantity as one cue to decide which group of these animals to approach as you're, uh, uh, as you're being a predator. Every day we look at numerical information when we, especially me in Canada, because we have very uh, extreme weathers, uh, we look at the weather, we compare different columns, each containing numerical information, we might use graphical as well as numerical information, and that again informs our decision making, whether I need to wear a winter coat today or not, whether I need to bring an umbrella with me to work. Trivial, everyday decision making that is influenced by our numerical knowledge, our numerical capacities. Imagine you're unable to read Arabic numerals. Imagine you find it very hard to activate the quantities associated with Arabic numerals. You would struggle in these everyday situations. Now, Derek mentioned I'm German, so numbers also have very emotional connotations. This one will forever stick in my mind, as I'm sure this one will forever stick in your minds. <laughs> Just aside, one is 2014, the other one is 2001. Again, numbers. These numbers, numbers can have long-term consequences. Small margins can have long-term global effects. So, Numerical information, how we process it, what kind of decisions we make against the background of it has critical consequences. Now, this talk is really about development, so we also need to consider how important early numerical skills are. I think over the past three decades, we've heard a lot about the importance of literacy, and I think tremendous progress has been made in connecting what we know about how children learn to read to what happens in classrooms. And there's been a lot of advocacy for literacy, quite rightly so. There are dyslexia associations. There are parent advocacy groups. It's not really the same when it comes to numeracy, yet we know from research that early numeracy is just as important as early literacy for later school achievement. A good example of this is a study led by Greg Duncan and others, including uh, researchers here from the UK, who did a meta-analytic study of uh, many, many tens of thousands of students for whom longitudinal data was available. In other words, data was available on their reading and math skills early in development, in early in the first grade, and then longitudinally there were subsequent data points of their math and reading achievement, as well as their socio-emotional skills, their attentional skills. So what Duncan and colleagues could do using these rich data sets is to estimate how strong is the relationship between early math and later math, but also to look at questions such as how much does early math matter for later reading or how much does early reading matter for later math. 
And what they found is the following. Each of these triangles represents a correlation between the early measured reading, math, attention, internalizing, externalizing, and social skills, and later math achievement. And the higher the triangle is, the stronger the association. So what you can see is very clearly that early math is a strong correlate of later math achievement. And early reading is also quite a strong correlate of later math achievement. It turns out that attention, internalizing, externalizing, and social skills measured early on don't tell you very much about how students will do later on in math. That's not to say that these aren't important competencies that students need to develop, but they don't seem to matter that much for later math. What was really surprising about the, these findings, and they have been replicated in independent samples, is what, what occurred when they looked at what predicts later reading skills. And here what they found was that math, early math skills, predict later reading skills with an equal strength as do early reading skills predict later reading skills. And in fact, when they looked across the whole data set, what is the strongest predictor of later school achievement? It turned out to be early math. So these findings, I think, really provide a powerful highlight of just how important early math skills are and that we shouldn't ignore them and that we should pay just as much attention to early math skills as we do to early reading skills. So that then leads to the question, well, what are some of the foundational competencies? What are some of the things that really count early on when children are first encountering numbers when they're learning about numerical relationships? What, are, what is scaffolding in early number development? Because we know from the literature on reading that if you've got good early foundations in phonological awareness and in phonics, you're going to build a good reading brain, or at least it's going to set you up on a positive developmental trajectory of success in reading. And yes, the analogy here is to phonological awareness. Really, in the domain of number in my field, we're always lagging behind research on reading. So we're trying to, in a way, find something that is equivalent or a set of skills that are equivalent to phonological awareness and uh, phonics. And that is because of the Matthew effect in reading, which Keith Stanovich at the University of Toronto documented in the 80s, where he showed using longitudinal data that children who don't have good phonological awareness early on have a much shallower trajectory of growth in reading over the school grades. Compared to their peers who start out with good phonological awareness, they also end up succeeding in reading. So I think this shows just how critical it is to use evidence to identify foundational competencies because if we can screen for those early on, then perhaps we can have, help children ref, refine their foundational competencies, which will set them on a positive growth of uh, a positive developmental trajectory. So what do we know about foundational competencies underlying math? Well, as psychologists and as cognitive neuroscientists, what we like to do when we ask questions about foundational competencies is to go right to the beginnings of development and to ask questions, daring questions, such as whether infants have a sense of quantity. Now, you might say, how can you even measure that? You can't ask an infant to count. You certainly can't give them addition problems. You can't ask them to name Arabic numerals. Well, researchers such as Fei Shu and Liz Belke have come up with a really creative way of trying to get inside the infant's mind and to try and understand whether infants have a rudimentary sense of numerical quantity and can discriminate between quantities. And the way they go about this is the following. They show infants' displays of objects, different sets of dots in this case, and they measure the infant's looking time towards that display of dots. And the idea is that once infants start to get bored, once they start to represent something about the display in front of them, they start to look away. And at that point, researchers say they have habituated to a particular display. For example, in face processing, let's say you were interested in understanding whether infants can discriminate between different facial expressions you might habituate them to a happy face. And then once they start to look away, they become disinterested. You show them a sad face, and then a happy face, and a sad face, and a happy face. And then you investigate whether they look longer towards the sad face compared to the happy face to which they had been habituated. 
And if you find that, if you find such a looking time difference, then you can say that the infants are able to discriminate between facial expressions. So let's consider how we might do that when we are interested in whether infants are sensitive to differences in the number of items in a display. So this is what an experimental stimulus might look like. These are 16 dots. They're randomly distributed across the screen. They vary in individual item size because what you want infants to abstract away from this display is the number or the approximate number of items in the display. So you might go on and you continue this, you have a different spatial uh, organization, different individual item sizes, but there's still 16 dots and so forth, always 16. Then the infant starts to get bored and now you show them a new display of dots that differs in the total number of items in the display. In this case, it's eight dots. And now the question is, does the infant become interested in these eight dots after having been habituated to 16 dots? And the answer seems to be yes. Schoen Spelke in 2000 reported that infants, six-month-old infants, are capable of discriminating between eight and 16 dots. But interestingly, another group of six-month-old infants was unable to discriminate between eight and 12. They took this to suggest that infants have a very noisy or what they call an approximate sense of numerosity. The numbers need to be sufficiently different from one another in order for infants to be able to discriminate between them. Later data suggested that nine months old are capable of discriminating between eight and 12 dots, but they cannot discriminate between eight versus 10 dots. So there seems to be some kind of refinement, if you like, over developmental time of this approximate sense of quantity. Another way we can ask about foundational competencies is to look in other species, to look in non-human primates, for example. And there's lots and lots of data to suggest that we share with other animals a basic sense of quantity. Just to give you an example, there's so much evidence in this field that I'm only going to pick one. A paper by Cantlon and Brannon published in 2005 in which they trained monkeys to essentially order numerosities, to touch the smaller numerosity first, the smaller number of dots in the display first, and then the larger number of dots. And what they found is that animals can get pretty good at this. And in a different study, they also found that if, for example, you train monkeys to discriminate between one to four dots, they can spontaneously generalize that performance to five to nine dots. So it's not just that they're getting better at a given range of numerosities, but what seems to be going on in their minds is something that has to do with number or approximate number more generally. And again, these animals find it harder to discriminate between dots the closer they are together, just like the infants, suggesting some kind of similarity there across species in the way we approximately represent these dot arrays. Brain imaging has also uh, painted a picture of developmental continuity in the brain systems underlying our non-symbolic numer numerical abilities. So for example, our abilities to discriminate dot arrays or, or sequences of tones. So these data, this is a slide from a review paper by Melissa Libertus and Brannon, suggests that similar brain regions in the intraparietal sulcus, particularly in the right hemisphere, are activated when you do a dot discrimination task in very young babies, in children, as well as in adults suggesting that in the right IPS there might be a system for uh, non-symbolic number processing, such as dot processing, that shows some developmental continuity. So from these data, many have concluded that we are born with a sense of non-symbolic quantities, so a sense of quantity that doesn't require us to have abstract symbols such as Arabic numerals or number words or Chinese ideographs, and that we share that with other species. And some people refer to this as the approximate number system because of the findings that the discriminability depends on the difference between the numbers. So the infants, for example, were able to discriminate 8 versus 16, but not 8 versus 12. It's sort of a fuzzy, approximate system of numerosity representation. So one of the most dominant hypotheses in our field, and I'll get to the educational implications of that shortly, is that our symbolic numerical abilities are grounded in this approximate number system. So consider, for example, this quote in a review paper by Manuela Piazza, who states that humans are born with strong intuitions on approximate numerical quantities and their relations. 
there is evidence to suggest that, these, that culture based acquisition is grounded on these pre existing intuitions. So, the argument here is that when we learn about symbols, we connect them to this system that is already in place early in infancy that we share with other species and that shows a brain signature that seems to be continuous across developmental time. And I think there are two possible educational implications or predictions that you can derive from this hypothesis. The first one is that if this is true, then we should find that your ability to discriminate between dot arrays, for example, predicts symbolic math learning and can be used to screen children who are at risk. And that would be wonderful. We could start screening children before they learn number symbols. And beyond correlation, because of course from correlations we can't make any causal inferences, one of the predictions might be that if you train non-symbolic numerosity processing, you give children lots of opportunities to compare dot arrays or to do other things with dot arrays, that should improve their math. Because if that's the foundational system, if you improve that system, then eventually children will be able to learn their symbolic numbers uh, more easily. So I want to explore whether these predictions are actually supported by the evidence, because I think if they turn out to be true, they would have very important educational implications for screening, but also for potential intervention students, for students who are struggling with math early on. So first I want to explore whether how good you are at doing a dot discrimination task such as that one, how good you are at judging on which side of the screen you see more dots is correlated with children's performance on tests of arithmetic and other aspects of early math. The evidence here suggests that there is at best a weak relationship, disappointingly so. So this is a meta-analysis looking at 45 peer-reviewed papers in which researchers from different laboratories, different countries across the world, um, were looking at the correlation between something like dot comparison and math abilities. And you can see the average correlation they found is uh, 0.21 with a range from 0 to 1. So this is a very low or moderate association. Certainly something that you wouldn't think is particularly clinically or educationally significant. And there are other reasons to suspect that dot comparison may not just be uh, measuring your numerical ability. So I want to do a short experiment with you as the audience. What you will see is two dot arrays, just like in the example before. You will see one on the left and one on the right. And all I want you to do is to shout out as quickly as you can on which side you think the larger number is occurring. Okay? So here we go. First one, so shout left if you think the numerically larger dot array is on the left side, and shout right if you think the numerically larger dot array is on the right side. Okay. I don't have your reaction times, but I think there was a little bit more ambiguity on the second display. So why might that be? In both cases, there were 21 dots on the left and 26 on the right. The difference is that in the first example, the total amount of area occupied by the dots was also correlated with the number of dots. So they were, the 26 dots were also physically larger. So this is what we call a congruent condition. In the second condition, what you have is what's called an incongruent condition. So now you actually have, on average, smaller dots for the numerically larger array of dots. And that's confusing. That interferes with your decision making. And you need to use something called inhibitory control because you need to ignore those variables that are uh, correlated with numbers such as the uh, density, uh, the average uh, area occupied by the dots in order to focus in on number. So that's a problem in these dot comparison tasks. And there is actually evidence to suggest that if you control for inhibitory control, the relationship between dot comparison and math achievement goes away. So this is work by Camilla Gilmore and colleagues at Loughborough University showing that one of the things that goes on when we're measuring dot comparison is not, we're not just automatically tapping into some kind of number system, but in order to do the task, because numbers always correlated with other variables in the dot comparison task, we need to apply inhibitory control, particularly when uh, there is a conflict between the non-numerical variables such as area and the numerical variable, the total number of items in the set. 
So the correlation between ANS tasks, approximate number system tasks, such as dot comparison and math, may not be necessarily due only to numerical acuity, but there are other variables that we might be measuring when we're giving people dot comparison tasks. And we know that inhibitory control is also independently associated with math achievement. So that's one problem. Another problem is the direction of the relationship. So it makes sense when you consider the evidence from infants and animals that the direction should be from non-symbolic, from dot comparison, to symbolic. But as uh, Simon Conway Morris points out in this very nice article called It All Adds Up or Does It, he says, he's a philosopher, at first sight, comfort might be given by studies that show how in infants and children there is a positive, albeit weak, correlation between numerosity and mathematical ability, but correlation need neither be directly causal nor necessarily cut only one way. One could argue, for example, that being better at mathematics serves to improve judgments and numerosity, so that when you learn your number symbols, you get better at the discrimination task. So we tried to investigate this in a longitudinal study that we recently completed. We had the good fortune to be able to collaborate with the Research and Assessment Division of the Toronto District School Board, and they gave us access to over 500 students who were in senior kindergarten. We have junior and senior kindergarten in Canada. Senior kindergarten, the children are around five years of age. They came from 35 schools in the Toronto District School Board. It's the largest school board in North America. They were tested first in the fall of 2014 and then in the spring of uh, 2015. So we essentially were able to test them at the beginning of senior kindergarten and at the end of senior kindergarten. And we gave them paper and pencil measures of a variety of things. I'm just going to focus in on our number comparison task and our dot comparison task. So what children have to do is to cross out as quickly and as accurately as they can the larger of the two Arabic numerals or the larger of the two dot arrays. And they get some practice with that and instructions and so forth. So what we could do then is to investigate whether change in your symbolic number processing abilities predicts change in your non-symbolic number processing abilities or vice versa. And what we found is actually supportive of uh, Conway's arguments. We found no evidence that growth in non-symbolic over this year in senior kindergarten predicted symbolic number abilities at the end of kindergarten. But instead, we found that the reverse was true that there was actually support for his hypothesis, that sim growth in no symbolic number processing actually affected non-symbolic number processing at the end of kindergarten. So it seems to be that when children get a sense of symbolic number, that that allows them to do the non-symbolic number processing task in a different way and improves their performance. In related work, researchers uh, at UC Irvine have found that children who don't yet understand that counting enumerates sets, that don't yet have what we call the cardinality principle. They find it incredibly hard to do this dot discrimination task. Now, this, these are still correlational studies, including our longitudinal study. We still can't make good causal inferences. So what about training studies? What if I design an app or some kind of game where I give children the opportunity to train up their approximate number system? Is that going to improve their math skills? So I might have something like this. I would give them lots and lots of number comparison abilities. I try to make the game fun. You know, I try to make it adaptive so that children who are racing through it don't get bored and children who are slow don't get frustrated. Well, there seems to be lots of evidence in the literature that even very brief amount of non-symbolic training enhances, as in this case, in a paper by Daniel Hyde, subsequent exact symbolic number abilities. Lots of examples like this. This is just from uh, um, last year by Junku Park, again, suggesting that there are these transfer effects, and not just in Western samples, but some work here also from Pakistan, suggesting that you get this in a different cultural context as well. Well, Dennis Schutz at the University of Cambridge wrote a very critical analysis of this research literature, looking at design features, looking at the way the data were analyzed. And he concluded that as he says, we conclude that there is no conclusive evidence that specific ANS, approximate number system training, improves symbolic arithmetic. 
And similar conclusions were reached in a meta-analysis by Inglis and colleague, again uh, from the University of Loughborough, who used what's called a P-curve analysis, and if you're interested in that, I can uh, talk to you about that in the Q&A sessions about the details of it. But what they conclude is that our findings indicate that the published literature to date does not contain evidence of a causal link between performance on ANS tasks and standardized math tests, and that ANS training doesn't lead to very strong gains in symbolic math. That's not to say that in the future we might find some way of training this approximate number system that transfers to symbolic math, but at this point in time, the evidence seems to be weak at best. So to answer the question, does non-symbolic matter, does the sort of pre-existing, perhaps even innate system for approximate number matter? The evidence suggests, first of all, that it's not a good measure of individual differences. The correlations are small. They could be explained by other factors, such a, as inhibitory control, which you need if you're going to vary the item sizes in the overall area. And therefore, they're likely not to have great utility for identifying children at risk. And training non-symbolic doesn't seem to do very much in terms of improving math skills. So that's kind of disappointing. So I would argue that the very nice story about evolutionary and developmental continuity of the system doesn't really inform uh, education in particular ways, at least when it comes to this characterization of an approximate number system. So what other skills might be foundational? Well, I would argue where we really need to look at is at how children learn numerical symbols. Without numerical symbols, they can't do addition, they can't do any sort of arithmetic. And numerical symbols, of course, are a human invention. Over the course of cultural history, we've invented different forms that have uh, increased in their iconicity. And now Arabic numerals are almost a universal language of mathematics. You can engage in a financial transaction with somebody in, in Shanghai without necessarily being able to speak Chinese. So it's quite incredible. They allow us to do lots of different things. And of course, numerical symbols learning is actually quite complex. As adults, of course, you know, we, read, we open a newspaper. You open your, your favorite newspaper in the morning. You're constantly processing Arabic numerals. On every single page, there's numerical information. But try to put yourself in the head of a four-year-old and think about all of the different things that they have to learn about these abstract squiggles on a page, which is what they are for them when they first encounter them. They don't have any meaning. And it turns out, of course, that numerical symbols have multiple reference. So the one that we think about most commonly when we think about development is cardinality. So the symbol five refers to all possible sets of a quantity of five. That's a symbol quantity relationship. But symbols are, of course, also part of a sequence. So therefore, they carry positional or rank information, such as for five, we know that it comes before six, but after five. So there's symbol-symbol relationships that children need to learn. They need to learn something about the number sequence. They also need to learn that Arabic numerals are a visual category. So the same thing that is true for letters, where children need to learn in variants, is also true for numbers. They can be printed in different forms. Mom spells is in one way. Dad writes number five in another way. They need to recognize that that all refers to the same thing. And numbers can be transcoded. You can have symbolic verbal numbers, such as number words, which are the first number symbols that children learn. And you can have visual number symbols, such as the Arabic numerals. And then, of course, later on, it gets even more complicated when you introduce multi-digit number processing, where now you have place value, where five, its position in the multi-digit number sequence determines its value. So there's lots of things that are going on when children first learn about Arabic numerals and about number words that go far beyond the relationship between number words and the quantities that are associated with them. And when it comes to foundational skills, there is indeed a growing body of research that shows that children's early understanding of numerical symbols is a critical scaffold. And I want to illustrate this with one of my favorite studies by David Purpura, Barudi, Barudi and Lonigan, published uh, a few years ago in the Journal of Educational Psychology called The Transition from Informal to Formal Mathematical Knowledge, Mediation by Numeral Knowledge. So what they're looking at is that critical gap between uh, early informal education in daycare settings, in preschools, and then early elementary school education. How do children make that transition? Because that transition can be quite dramatic. 
at least in the Canadian context, I see that children are doing quite different things in grade one compared to senior kindergarten. Senior kindergarten tends to be play-based and creative, and then there's real sit-down uh, mentality in grade one. So the way they investigated this was to, in a longitudinal setting, in kindergarten, to measure lots of what they refer to as informal math skills, such as verbal counting, one-to-one -one counting, cardinality, subitizing, set comparison, and story, story problems. And they put that under one factor called informal knowledge. And then a year later, they measured their children's arithmetic abilities. And as you can see, maybe you can't see it here, the correlation between informal and formal knowledge, so this longitudinal correlation, was 0.84. So that's a very large correlation. And it's not one that's entirely surprising, because that's what Duncan and colleagues also found in their data sets with tens of thousands of students. But what was really interesting was what happened when they looked at the potential mediating role of knowing your digits and being able to link digits to quantity. So what they found here was that another factor called numeral knowledge, composed of two different tasks, numeral identification and set to numerals, fully mediated, fully in a sense, explained the relationship between informal and formal mathematical abilities, suggesting then that Knowing your symbols, being able to name your symbols, and being able to map the symbols onto quantities is a critical bridge between informal and formal early mathematical knowledge. And these were the tasks, just in case you were wondering, the numeral ID task was simply just naming Arabic numeral. What number is this? And the set to numeral task looks something like this. You saw an Arabic numeral, and you had to pick the dots that matched that Arabic numeral in terms of quantity. And interestingly, they found that if you only entered one of those mediators, numeral ID or set to numeral, there wasn't full mediation anymore. So you really needed both. And I think that's kind of critical because it suggests that it's not just about mapping symbols to quantities, but also being able to name those symbols turns out to be a critical mediator. Now, I don't know, unfortunately, I don't know enough about the British curriculum, but when I give this talk to educators in Canada, they always say, well, symbols, does that mean that kids have to sit down very early on when they're four and five and, you know, do worksheets and so forth? And I always try to convince people, no, you can use number symbols in the context of play-based learning. And there's lots of examples that I found on social media, kindergartens that I follow, where people post pictures of activities that really integrate symbols into play-based learning. Here's one of those activities, matching symbols to quantities. And in addition to that, if you look at the non-symbolic, if you look at the dot arrays in different spatial arrangements, kids in this activity are also learning that the particular spatial arrangement of a set of dots doesn't affect the cardinality, doesn't affect the total number of items in the set. So it's an exercise in also mapping between symbols and quantity and abstraction as well. These wonderful learning carpets in which you can explore all sorts of things with symbol quantity relationships, ordinality, invariance as well. You know, having the Arabic digits printed in different font sizes, of course, is another thing that children have to learn, that the size of the number, the physical size of the number doesn't affect its cardinality and doesn't affect the way that the symbols are to be ordered. Lots of examples here. Scaling it all the way to geometry, you know, representing cardinality and geometric shapes. Wonderful things that kids can do in a play-based setting rather than sitting down. But they have the opportunity to learn something about those symbols early on. Artistic activities, you know, it depends on the creativity, I guess, of the early childhood educator, how far they push it, and then how much they can harness the creativity of the children as well. So these are just some examples to sort of say, no, a message about number symbols being an important bridge between informal and formal education is not one that says we need to stop doing play. It just says we need to integrate those symbols into play early on to give children the opportunity to come prepared to school. So how much does cardinality matter? I mentioned that as one of the very critical uh, reference of number symbols. So one of the ways we can assess this is to give number comparison tasks with uh, instead of with uh, dodgets, uh, instead, instead of with dots, with digits. So we can have Arabic numerals and we can ask people to compare which of two is larger. 
And together with my former postdoc, Ian Lyons, who's now at Georgetown University, we had the opportunity to look at a group of almost uh, 1,600 children and to give them various tasks. And this was a cross-sectional study where we pulled children from grades one to six. It was conducted in the Netherlands uh, together with uh, uh, my late collaborator, Leo Blomert. Um, and what we found in this study, this is, I'm sorry, the uh, slide is slightly dark, but what you're seeing here is the effect size plotted as a function of grade level, and what the line represents is essentially the strength of the association between symbolic number comparison and math achievement, and on the bottom between dot comparison and math achievement. And what you can very clearly see is that symbolic number comparison, which involves being able to access the cardinal referent of symbols and to compare them, is strongly associated with math achievement in grades one and two, but then the strength of that association declines as a function of grade. These are cross-sectional data. We would need to replicate this longitudinally to really say this is a developmental phenomena. Dot comparison, as you can see, doesn't do very much when you look at its effect size in explaining individual differences in math achievement across all six grades. So symbolic counts and being able to access the cardinal reference of symbols and to compare them to one another seems to explain a lot of individual differences, at least early on. Now, we've tried to turn this into a, a screener. Um, uh, my former graduate student, Nadia Nosworthy, who came from education, who was a former teacher, said to me, let's do away with computerized measures. Let's do a paper and pencil screener. So what she came up with was this uh, uh, screener that has two versions, a non-symbolic and a symbolic version. And children have to cross out the larger of two dot arrays or the larger of two Arabic numerals as quickly and accurately as they can. They get one minute per version of the test. And then Nadia was able to assess whether this test correlated with their math achievement uh, by using the Woodcock-Johnson math fluency, which is a speeded measure, and the Woodcock-Johnson calculation uh, subtest, which is an unspeeded measure, which was important to us because of the speeded nature of the screener. We wanted to ensure that we could see a relationship between individual differences in performance on our screener and an untimed measure to not just correlate speed with speed. And what Nadia found, again, supporting Ian's and other people's results, is that whilst both symbolic and non-symbolic were found to correlate with individual differences in arithmetic achievement, only symbolic accounted for unique variants for individual differences in performance in arithmetic after taking into account measures such as working memory, intelligence, and reading abilities. So taken together, these data again support that, it, that it's the symbols where it's at and not so much this approximate non-symbolic number system. The processing of number symbols is critical and is a very good predictor of individual differences in math performance. If you're interested in our screener, and it's by no means a diagnostic measure, uh, it has a big beta across the top because we're still working on getting in, uh, better norms, but if you want to have a look at it, it's online, it's free, you can download it, they're supporting videos, uh, all sorts of materials, and of course you can contact us as well if you feel like using it. But bear in mind, the norms that are currently on there are Ontario, Canada norms. So we don't, my dream is to scale this so that we can have norms from different countries, and if anybody in the room is interested in collaborating with us, we can certainly try to get some UK norms or an approximation thereof onto this website. So what about beyond cardinality? I refer to these multiple reference. So one of the things that we've been considering is ordinal processing. So Arabic numerals are, of course, part of an ordered sequence, and therefore, as I've already said, they carry positional and rank information. And so one of the things we asked children in this large cross-sectional study is not just to compare the cardinal reference of numbers in the, card in the number comparison task, but also to uh, do an ordinality task. And the way we set this up was to present them with triplets of Arabic numerals that were either in order or not, and we simply asked them to judge, are these three numbers in order or not? And then again, we were able to look at, across the six grades, the, uh, at the extent to which performance on this ordinality task told us anything about individual differences in arithmetic achievement. And what we found here was rather striking. So this is the result that I showed you before, the correlation between number comparison and arithmetic achievement across the six grades. If we then look at the correlation between the order task and arithmetic achievement, so between how well children did on the ordinality task and arithmetic achievement, we see that early on, 
it seems to be that ordinality doesn't explain very much in terms of individual differences in arithmetic achievement. But, by, but at grade six, it was the strongest predictor of all of the different processing tasks that we included in our battery. This, and we're still working on better understanding what is going on here, but we think that it might have something to do with children's decreasing reliance on direct mappings between symbol quantities and a greater uh, representation of the symbol-symbol relationships. And that, that essen essentially this reflects uh, increasing development of their symbolic number understanding and a greater sophistication of their symbolic number representations. But as I said, we're still working on that. And especially we need to go beyond just the correlational evidence to doing some experimental studies there as well. So earlier on, I asked whether training non-symbolic number processing, whether training the approximate number system enhances arithmetic achievement. Now that I've tried to convince you that early on, having children, giving children opportunities to learn their number symbols, to get a deep understanding of not just their cardinal reference, but their ordinal reference, I also therefore need to ask the question, does training symbolic number enhance arithmetic achievement. Because again, what I've shown you up to now with the symbols is all correlational data. So there aren't actually that many intervention studies around, but I do want to review one of them for you that was published last year uh, by Honore and Marie Pascal Noel called Improving Preschoolers Arithmetic Through Number Magnitude Training, the Impact of Non-Symbolic and Symbolic Training. And what they did in this study, this is with five-year-olds, so they're really looking at kindergartners, trying to find a way to uh, improve kindergartners' early symbolic and non-symbolic abilities. They had two sets of tasks, and for both tasks, they had a symbolic version and a non-symbolic version. So in this task, what the children simply have to do is to give the sack with the largest digit or the largest dots printed on top to the largest teddy. So they have to understand that relationship and know that the note that the sacks, of course, don't vary in their physical size. So they can't do this just on the basis of uh, correspondence between the physical size of the sack and the physical size of the teddy. They actually have to make the inference on the basis of either the Arabic numerals printed on the sack or the number of dots printed on the sack. So children are trained on this. It's an adaptive uh, uh, training program. And the question now is then, of course, do children who were assigned to the symbolic training condition, where the numbers were printed on the sacks, or do they improve more than those who were trained on the version with, uh, with the dot arrays printed on the sacks? They also had another training condition, which the same children also did to ensure that the uh, intervention wasn't too boring for kids. They had a number line estimation task in which they helped uh, uh, various characters find somebody they lost, and uh, the, the characters would get closer to the person that they lost, the more accurate they were. And they were either asked to place dot arrays on a continuum from one dot uh, to 10 dots, or they were asked to place an Arabic numerals, either single or multi-digit Arabic numerals, on a continuum from 1 to 20 in this case. And they got some feedback, uh, and they were looking for whether that would improve their accuracy in number line estimation, and then whether this process of being trained on number line estimation would transfer to arithmetic performance. And again, the question is here, if you're trained using the non-symbolic version with the dots, do you improve as much on arithmetic as when you're being trained with the symbolic version, uh, the Arabic numerals? And the results were pretty clear. So what you're seeing here is plotted percent correct responses on a post-test of arithmetic performance. And you can see in, the, in, in this line here, what you see here is this symbolic group. And you see uh, quite a large amount of improvement. In the control group who were neither of the interventions, who just did business as usual, they didn't show any improvement. And the non-symbolic non group seems to show some level of improvement, but this improvement is actually not significant. So the only group that showed a significant amount of improvement was the group that was trained using Arabic numerals. So these findings, and surely they need to be replicated, do seem to indicate that when you train children on number symbols, you do see transfer to arithmetic. However, when you train them on non-symbolic, consistent with the earlier studies of the approximate number training that are reviewed for you, you don't see the same level of improvement. 
This is, I think, one of the very few training studies that has actually directly compared the efficacy of symbolic training with the efficacy of non-symbolic training. And I think these kinds of studies are really important in order to get to a deeper understanding of what are some of the foundational skills and which of these foundational skills actually have an impact if you train them on children's math achievement. There's other um, pieces of evidence that suggest that symbolic number processing and training symbolic number processing leads to improvement in children's arithmetic abilities. Bob Siegler at Carnegie Mellon University has done lots of wonderful work using board games, using linear board games to train children's understanding of the association between number and space, of uh, the relationship between numbers such as snakes and ladders here. And what him and his colleague, inc colleagues including Gita Ramnani have found is that when you uh, have children from low socioeconomic backgrounds play these number board games, such as Snakes and Ladders, you see improvements in their number knowledge. So some very simple approaches to strengthening the uh, symbolic number knowledge of children who might not get the same opportunities in their homes as children whose parents have a lot of time to read number books with them, to play these kinds of games, to engage in number talk, uh, um, and so forth. So overall then, what are some of the implications of the literature that I've reviewed for you? I think the research that I've reviewed for you suggests that symbolic number knowledge is critical, and I would add to this that symbolic number knowledge is not trivial. And I think it's sometimes important for us as adults to try and put ourselves in the heads of four-year-olds and to think about the complexity that those abstract symbols that are the product of cultural history represent for them. It's an enormous task to learn these symbols and to become fluent at associating them with quantities, to become fluent at associating their ordinal representations, their physical invariance, the way they are transcoded to number words. There's lots of things that children have to learn that in our brains function fully automatically when we read the newspapers or when we engage in conversations. So things such as naming numerals, cardinality, ordinality, and also spatial mappings. I haven't talked about that enough, but that's another important component. You saw that in, in Bob Siegler's work with uh, mapping symbolic numbers into space and how that seems to improve children's understanding of symbolic number. Working on symbolic, non-symbolic mappings, and they don't need to be approximate. You can have children count out dot arrays and then see uh, which Arabic numeral or which number words they map to so that they can strengthen their understanding of the cardinal reference of number symbols. And I think, importantly, research suggests that training on non-symbolic alone won't transfer or won't transfer very much. I think the fact that at present in meta-analyses we see no effects doesn't mean that there aren't potential effects. But maybe we haven't found the right way of training the non-symbolic number system, it's unclear. But as of today, I think there's no strong evidence to suggest that if you train young children on non-symbolic number comparison that they're suddenly gonna get better at symbolic number. That hypothesis doesn't seem to have a lot of support today. And I think it's important that early on we give children the opportunity to develop fluency with the use of numerals. Often in classrooms that I visit in Canada, there's a great emphasis on manipulatives and they are no doubt important, but I think you can integrate the abstract level of representation, the symbolic representation, uh, earlier on. And then working with number, line, number lines, as, as Bob Siegler's work has suggested. And making numbers salient, I think that's another, when we did that experiment together, I think that illustrated how we need to uh, uh, be able to recognize the abstract property of set, its cardinality, whilst ignoring other variables that might be correlated with it. Finally, I focus very narrowly here on things that interest me. <laughs> symbolic number processing and foundational skills, and I just want to close by sort of highlighting my appreciation for the fact that math is multi-componential and that it's not just going to be symbolic number that's going to inform our understanding of how to build better mathematical brains. 
So if we consider math, there's lots of factors. Spatial cognition has been found to be strongly associated with individual differences in math, though efforts to try and just train spatial cognition, again, do not transfer to math. So it's about finding ways of embedding math within spatial tasks. Just training mental rotation doesn't improve children's math skills. Working memory is a very important component of anything in learning. And of course, working memory plays a large role in math as well. Emotional factors, which I haven't had the time to talk about, but which you're going to have a session about next year. Math anxiety is a topic that I think has been discussed in educational circles for a long time, but I think researchers have only tried, started to seriously study it for the past 10 years or so. But emotional and cognitive factors, of course, like in any process of learning, interact in the process of learning math. Phonological awareness is correlated with math achievement as well. So there might be some interesting uh, uh, interlinkages here between acquisition of reading and math. Executive functioning, which working memory is part of, we did that task. You, you were slower when there was a conflict between the total area that the dots occupied and the number of dots. That's inhibitory control. That's part of executive functioning. Matters for math. Language, cross-linguistic differences in the way in which we represent number words have an enormous effect on math learning. The transparency of a language when it comes to the way it represents numbers. And then basic number processing, which is what I've focused on. And then, of course, teachers. Teachers matter, uh, matter enormously for children's math achievement and the kinds of pedagogies that they implement. And then, of course, all of these skills interact with one another. I didn't want to completely make it into spider webs, but there should be a lot more arrows here than there are. And importantly, all of this happens over developmental time. And different competencies matter at different points in the learning trajectory. So what I've really tried to focus in on is what are the kinds of skills that help children early on get math off the ground. Once they have them, other factors may become even more important once they have a fluent understanding of numerical symbols. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, and I think we've got some time for questions. Thank you.